Well, <clears throat> it looks like we're live uh, from reading the, uh, the notes in the chat room. Um, okay. it, is a, uh, it is a pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm Clifton Leaf. I'm editor-in-chief of Fortune Magazine in New York. And I am so pleased and honored to join uh, all of you today to discuss the United Nations Global Compacts, uh, Global Compact, which is a non-binding non pact to encourage all businesses to act in socially responsible ways. Um, and the initiative is now calling on business leaders to unite to support communities affected by the COVID pandemic. Um, last year in August, as many will recall, the influential Business Roundtable um, explicitly changed its manifesto after uh, more than two decades, since 1997, to really uh, explicitly put shareholders first. Um, in an atmosphere of widening economic inequality and deepening distrust of business, the powerful group has, has redefined that mission in, in much of the conversation. And Fortune as well, uh, the magazine that I run, um, many years ago started something called the Change the World List, which focuses on companies that are doing well by doing good. And that has sparked something called the CEO Initiative, which is also focused on re imagining the social compact with the communities the business serves. Um, I had an, an all-star group of people that are, are, are will be joining us at some point. Um, I am very pleased to mention, uh, to, to welcome all of them as they as they jump in. Uh, but right now I am joined uh, in, in actually Jackson Hole, Wyoming by Hank McKinnell, Dr. Hank McKinnell, who is chairman of Moody's uh, USA and was a long time uh, Chief Executive Officer of the Pfizer Corporation. Um, hey, I'd, I'd love to talk to you because for a long time, many, many terms, you were in charge of the Business Roundtable, which has a very similar mission to the Global Compact. And um, so you've seen how the conversation has changed with business leaders uh, around the world uh, as to its, its uh, relationship with the communities uh, that they serve. Talk a little bit about what you've learned in this process in the last couple of years. Well, the history here, I think, is important. Uh, from the very beginning, modern corporations uh, defined their mission as producing returns for shareholders. Uh, and when it came to social causes, whether it was polluting the environment or burning down rainforests for your agricultural business, uh, the attitude was, unfortunately, what I call the tyranny of the ore. A chief executive officer of a major corporation would say, look, either we produce returns for shareholders or we produce valuable goods and services for society. Our business is producing returns for shareholders, we leave the rest of it to government and not-for-profit organizations. Uh, the realization was, though, that if society defines you as a bad actor, uh, you're going to lose your implicit license to operate. Society will not allow you to continue to maximize returns for shareholders while you're doing things that society doesn't want. So clearly we've moved uh, over, I think, 20 years, but certainly over the last two or three, to what I call the power of the end. Our goal is to maximize value for shareholders and provide benefits to society. So the challenge for management and boards of directors is what do you focus on? What do you do to provide benefits to society so that your shareholders can benefit? Uh, that recognition has been established. I'm not sure yet we have the metrics, the ability to measure results, and the incentives built into management compensation plans yet to make that a reality. But certainly the recognition is there, and that, I think, is the way forward. That, that's great. So the recognition, the mission that companies can do well and do good, uh, and in fact do well while they're doing good, um, is is a fundamental shift, but we need we do need those measurements to make sure that we are actually holding those actions accountable, and we do what you measure. Um, we have joined uh, us uh, His Excellency Munir Akram, who's the president of the United Nations Economic and Social Council. Ambassador, um, 
I, we now are, of course, in a, a, a completely different circumstance than we were a year ago. We had a, a pandemic that has swept through the, glo- the globe, uh, causing, uh, you know, a million deaths already um, and, and many more to come. It, it's even more important uh, for companies, this, this sort of third uh, leg of the stool of, uh, of, of global uh, connectedness, to sort of work together. And we've seen that very much in the back among vaccine makers, um, including with companies that are partnering with others uh, in, in ways that they never did before. Um, talk a little bit about, if you would, how COVID-19 has changed the conversation or made it more urgent. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you very much uh, uh, for, for having me uh, at, uh, at this panel. Um, as you know, we've been dealing with uh, the effects of this pandemic at the United Nations. Uh, the Secretary General has been very vocal uh, about the impact of, of COVID-19. Uh, I think the first conclusion that one can draw out from this pandemic is that it has been a, a revealer it has it has shown the weaknesses uh, in the structures uh, of uh, national governance, but even more so in the international economic system. The structures of inequality uh, and uh, other inequities uh, which have uh, made this pandemic a crisis, especially for the poorest. Uh, It has also shown that when faced with a a compulsion that governments and policymakers are able to respond. The, The fact that the OECD countries the reserve currency countries have been able to issue $13 trillion in fiscal stimulus is an indication that when the compulsion is there and when the political will is there, that liquidity can be generated and liquidity can be injected into the system. But at the same time, it has shown the inequality because the developing countries, which are estimated to require at least around $2.5 trillion in their efforts to recover from this crisis, they are nowhere near finding the money to be able to respond uh, to the crisis. Um, And um, there are efforts to find a solution to the debt, uh, uh, to the debt overhang. Uh, There are efforts to find uh, the generation of liquidity through the IMF and through the World Bank. And some have been generated, some steps have been taken. Uh, For example, you have the the debt suspension initiative of the Group of 20. Uh, But in total, the debt suspension so far, there are 73 eligible countries, 44 have accepted the debt suspension, and the total relief that would be made available to these 44 countries will be in the range of $12 billion, as compared to the requirement which I mentioned for all developing countries by $2.5 trillion. So we have to find ways to generate those resources. And many suggestions have been put forward. The Secretary General, uh, together with Canada, Prime Minister of Canada and Jamaica, have convened a series of meetings uh, at the United Nations uh, in which various, uh, a whole menu of options has been put forward of what could be done, uh, what could possibly be done uh, in the short term and the longer term uh, space. Uh, 
and and some of some of the there are good proposals. Uh, there is uh, one extending the DSSI, the death suspension of the G20, trying to cover middle-income countries as well, and in, in the death suspension, uh, cancellation of uh, the debt of the least developed countries, or major restructuring at least. Uh, vastly expanded concessional financing from the IFIs uh, and, and the IMF, for example, has boasted that they have one trillion dollars in firepower. Mm -hmm. But most of this firepower is available only to countries <clears throat> with market fundamentals. Uh, and that therefore, by definition, excludes a large number of the developing countries. Yeah. Uh, such. So and that's, that's that's a those are a really important points, and and especially that last one. You know, we've we've seen that over the last year, thirty seven uh, million people, more people, uh, enter below the poverty line. You know, so so they've they've gotten into to to true deep poverty, uh, reversing about twenty years worth of progress in the UN Sustainability Development Goals. Um, I want to welcome Ms. Sanda Ojiambo, Executive Director of the UN Global Compact, and specifically talk about those 37 new uh, impoverished people uh, around the world who, um, who actually have a, a, a more near-term urgency uh, to have their needs addressed um, by not just, um, you know, the, the large governments of the world, but also by business, which is really what the Global Compact is. How, do, how does business step up and address that immediate need of poverty Great. caused by COVID? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, gentlemen. Great to join you on the panel. Sorry for joining a little bit late. And you raise a very important point. I think, you know, we've seen how the COVID pandemic has actually exacerbated what some of these really, you know, long-standing structural inequalities were. I mean, statistics tell us that I think, you know, COVID wiped out close to, I think, 6.7 working hours globally in the second quarter of 2020, you know, 100, 195 million uh, full-time jobs lost. And, you know, if you think about where we have the, the poorest and most marginalized populations, um, millions have lost their jobs. Millions of small and medium enterprises have also, you know, uh, had to close down, actually, and that's applied across the whole world. So, you know, our call to business is really to take the opportunity and, you know, what we're calling this build forward better, to really look at how they could do more inclusive business. Um, and, you know, inclusive business now, now calls for taking into consideration a couple of things, social safety nets, you know, um, universal health care, um, key elements to just make sure that we can bring populations back to what really should be, you know, what a living wage is. Our call to business is really to take this opportunity to look at addressing key issues such as longstanding gender pay gaps that, that have existed over time. So the view is, as, as we look to reset and rebuild, and certainly there's, there's very big macro parameters, you know, the cl climate crisis is a big one to address. The lost jobs is a big one to address you know, stimulating economies and driving forward economy, uh, economic growth is a big one. But we've got to look at the people. And I think you raise a fundamental point. When the Global Compact was formed 20 years ago, Kofi Annan said he formed it to bring a human face to the global market. So this is a perfect opportunity to look at what does doing business with a human face look like and taking into consideration the millions that you said that have now been disenfranchised due to COVID. Senator, those are great points. Hank, I want to come back to you because one of the things about business is, you know, sometimes we take a long time to think about something and then plan it and then develop the resources for it and budget for it for, for next year and develop a five-year plan. And, and really, a lot of the crises, although they are global and long-lasting, you know, are, are calling for a more urgent timetable of action. Hank, can you talk a little bit about how, um, you know, businesses change gears from from normal drive to, uh, to overdrive? I think you're on mute for a second. Um, you might... Sorry about that. <laughs> we're, all learn we're all learning together here. Yeah, exactly. Um, well, the healthcare industry's response to the global pandemic is a great example. Uh, I met President George W. Bush shortly after 9-11, and they were very worried about an anthrax attack. And the president asked me, 
uh, how long would it take the industry to produce a vaccine if we had credible uh, intelligence about somebody trying to harm the United States with the release of anthrax? And I said, Mr. President, that deserves a, a uh, more complete answer than I can give you, and I will get that answer for you. But the one thing I can tell you is if the FDA regulates it, it'll be 14 years before we have a, before we have a uh, uh, vaccine. Now, that was said in jest. The FDA obviously does better than that. Uh, but it had a point that regulation clearly slows down the business response. Uh, here we are six months into this pandemic. There are over 100 vaccines in development, three that are in the final testing period. There's more than 1,500 therapeutics in development, many of which will read out this fall. So how is that possible? Well, it's a little bit in military terms, like commando teams that go in very quickly, but frankly don't have a lot of firepower, versus heavy armor, which takes a little while to get organized and geared up, but when it hits, it hits very hard. Uh, big business is more like heavy armor than it is a commando team, I will admit. Uh, but the response here shows very clearly that if it's important enough, if it's focused, uh, you then get this very dramatic uh, uh, outpouring of innovation and technology and new products. And I don't know when we're going to have a vaccine, but I can tell you it's not going to be 14 years. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the response to COVID from the larger biopharma, the global biopharma community has been extraordinary. Ambassador, I, I want to ask you, though, because, you know, when you're dealing with a, um, a roving virus that has, has affected every con- country in the world, that gets your urgency alarm going. Uh, but for things like, uh, you know, slow moving catastrophes or not so slow moving catastrophes like global warming, uh, like climate change, or the the widening gap between the haves and have nots financially, um, which is becoming uh, quite stark, uh, or the lack of, of of gender parity in much of the world, or things like that. How do we begin to put that sort of urgency sign on many of those uh, crises and bring business in? Uh, yes, I, I think that's a that's a very good question in in terms of. Um, how how do we align the business models to the goals that we are trying to promote in the in the SDGs, for example? I think we have a blueprint now of what is required. Uh, what is required across the board in terms, you know, from poverty to health to gender parity, etc. The goals have been defined. Targets have been defined. How do we bring urgency to that, uh, to those goals? How, how do we direct not only governments, but also businesses to prioritize uh, those, those goals in their, in their plans? Uh, I think in the final analysis, it's, it's a question of decision making. Uh, just as we have the decisions that have been made with regard to the, the production of a vaccine, uh, these these are decisions that were driven by the requirement, which is urgent, uh, and also by the fact that the, that the company which will actually produce the vaccine stands to make a lot of money. Uh, so it is both the target and the incentive uh, that has to be created in order to address those those issues. How do we incentivize gender parity, for example? Uh, is there some way that we can introduce a, um, a, a not a conditionality but a, a, a qualification uh, for certain companies or certain uh, uh, corporations uh, to be able to have that gender parity target. The Secretary General, for example, in inside the UN has been very active in in the sense uh, that he has ensured gender parity at various high-level decision-making uh, making levels. Similarly, uh, when you take, uh, for example, the target of, of trying to achieve poverty alleviation, in poverty alleviation, the breakthroughs which are required 
from science or the, at least the application of the technologies that are required in developing countries are fairly well known. Uh, they, and they have been successfully applied uh, by so many countries uh, in, in their own environments at the national level. Uh, I believe we need to find ways to incentivize companies which possess those technologies to be able to go to developing countries and invest there. Uh, the, and and the, the returns for them need to be guaranteed. In the case of the vaccine, uh, it is guaranteed because they, are, they have contracts for purchase of the vaccine. Every com the company which is investing in vaccine research has got a contract for, for certified purchase uh, uh, of the vaccine. Similarly, we can create incentives for companies to go into developing countries and with some guarantees from official or, or unofficial sources, some kinds of guarantees of returns. Uh, and and those, those returns may not come immediately from the country itself or from the investment itself, but it could come with the backing of guarantees that could be provided. Uh, I think that's only one way. I, I think there are, there are different ways in which we can find how to incentivize the companies, the corporations, which have the financial firepower, have the technological skills, have the management skills to be able to go into developing countries uh, as such. This is the big, this is the big divide, is the yeah. inability or unwillingness to go into developing countries because the profits are not upfront, they are not guaranteed, they are not secured, and we have to find some mechanism in which to link the SDGs with incentives for the private sector. Yeah, <clears throat> Ambassador, you've, you've definitely identified the, the core challenge here. Asanda, I want to I want to come to you now because what we've learned in, in the fight against COVID is how connected the world is. We always knew that, of course. We've seen that with global warming. We've seen that <clears throat> with everything. Um, but but COVID really brought that that reality to the fore. Um, in terms of the way businesses have stepped up and worked with governments and worked with the nonprofit groups and NGOs um, has been very reaffirming. But what's important is to sort of make sure that the rubber band doesn't snap back. So, and, and when it comes time to sort of focusing on, on, on the challenges, many companies still go back to what's in their backyard um, or front yard. And so the question is, um, how do you and does the UN Global Compact really continue to bring this sense of global connectedness to the world's challenges and therefore the world's solutions? Thank you. Um, great question. You know, um, we do need to move forward. Uh, we kicked off the uh, General Assembly week last week, uh, you know, from the Global Compact perspective by presenting the Secretary General with over 1,200 signatures from business leaders representing about 100 countries around the world, making a commitment to a renewed commitment to international cooperation. Um, those businesses and those business leaders, just being a representation of our membership, signal this commitment, recognizing the importance of rebuilding business, of rebuilding business across economies and across countries as being an important part for overall stimulating or re-stimulating the economy and international cooperation. I think it's very important, as we say, for business to work hand in hand with government, with civil society, and certainly with other businesses. This is our um, public commitment to it, and we continue to do this in many levels through our local networks around the world, where we partner very strongly with UN country teams and certainly with other business organizations to do this. So our commitment truly is to not only drive responsible business in country, but drive responsible business through countries. Um, many of our larger companies also have very substantial supply chains and value trains, chains that cross multiple businesses. Our call again there is to embrace what we call our 10 principles, which are mm -hmm. principles for sustainable and responsible business, but also driving business that uh, delivers on the sustainable development goals. And to Ambassador's earlier point, I think it's important to put the incentives in the right place. Um, a study done by the Business for Sustainable Development Commission signaled a $12 trillion, $12 trillion business opportunity if business was done focused on the sustainable development goals. So right there is the business opportunity. 
Um, I think the challenge, as Ambassador rightly said, in, in developing markets is perhaps the incentives or the profit is not seen up front, but suddenly the numbers, the customers and the consumers are there. So it's a shift in business model. It's a shift in understanding perhaps a different customer demographic, but there certainly is value to be unlocked. And to be very clear at the compact, you know, we see purpose and profit going hand in hand. So for us, this is a massive business opportunity ready to be unlocked. Yeah, this this comes back to <clears throat> Hank's ampersand, the and sign uh, versus the or. Um, these things do go hand in hand. But, you know, as Hank, as Sand- Sandra just mentioned, you know, we, we have the principles which are, are driving the global compact and we have the vision and we have the incentive uh, ultimately, which is this enormous potential market uh, for, for opportunity uh, for businesses who want to, uh, to partner with that. But what we don't necessarily have is are the tactics, are the are the are the methods, are the sort of on the ground sort of all right. Here's the here's the game plan, um, and and that's so critical for you as a longtime business leader, um, and and somebody who counsels other businesses through Moody's. How do how do we bring in those tactics and methods uh, to make this real? Well, management and business is all about achieving results through others. And the key question is here is how do we get the results? Uh, And if you have a chemical reaction and you want to speed it up, you add a catalyst. We have a catalyst in this field. Fairly recently arrived, it's the investors. Large investors have realized that management has spent time maximizing short-term return for shareholders, but their interest is different. They're managing pension funds and very long-term money. They're managing endowments, which last 100 years. And they've now come to the business community, and investors have come to the business community and said, look, we're interested in long-term results. Sustainability matters. How you're doing on the ESG principles matters to us. We want to know what you're doing and how you're holding you as boards of directors, how you're holding management accountable, and how do you measure the results. Uh, I'll speak for Moody's now. Moody's service is to provide information and risk management tools to investors and issuers of debt. Increasingly, we're being asked to, in addition to evaluating the credit worthiness of a 10-year bond, to evaluate the sustainability worthiness of the company that's issuing that bond. Uh, There are trillions of dollars now flowing into green bonds, ESG investing, not just in Europe or the United States. There's a very large market in China, for example, as well, for exactly the same thing. So the catalyst now has been the investor. So if you can't answer the investor's questions, you're not going to be, you're not going to attract capital and you're not going to attract capital at a rate which is attractive enough for you to invest and produce results. So the investors are playing a very large role here. Ambassador, I mean, thank you, Hank. Those, those, that's really key. And the challenge is how you measure that ROI, that return on investment in, in something that doesn't fall neatly into a financial ledger. Um, but these conversations are changing, Ambassador, and, and big investors are looking at a longer term horizon uh, for their investment payouts. And also, in some cases, uh, really trying to measure the impact, uh, whether it's on sustainability or, or solving a societal problem. I, I imagine that must be part of your conversations daily with stakeholders. C- certainly. Um, I, I, I think that uh, one of the things we are looking at at the present moment, and uh, I'm actually in discussions with the Secretary General and the Deputy Secretary General, is the possibility of creating a a sustainable in infrastructure investment facility. Uh, we know that there are some other facilities. The G20 has, has uh, is also initiating a, a similar exercise. But the United Nations uh, has a, a unique vantage point as the custodian of the SDGs. Uh, and investors of course, they're looking for sustainability. They're looking for sustainable long-term investment, but they don't always get access to it. 
And, and the reason they don't get access to it is because a, a large number of developing countries do not have the capacity or the capability to actually take a plan and make it into a project. Uh, they are unable to formulate a feasibility study, leave alone a feasibility study, which is, which is bankable. So we need to bridge this gap between a plan for a small developing country, whether it's Burundi, Rwanda, to take, take its plan and transform it into a bankable project into which investors can can invest. And that function can be performed by a facility with the imprimatur and the umbrella of the United Nations. And this is something that I am actively trying to encourage. And, 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 Master, and, and for our other panelists, you know, we actually have a great uh, question in our chat room uh, from Ananda Satio, and he writes, uh, uh, in Indonesia, as a renewable energy player, we have to face the fact that we have to compete with fossil fuels and don't get any incentives. What's your advice uh, that the private sector can be well incentivized uh, from government um, to, to make a massive investment in renewable energy um, a reality? And I think this is a great question, and I'm hoping that we'll get some more uh, questions in the, in the chat room in our last few minutes. So, do, do, do Sanda or, or the ambassador or Hank, any of you want to grab at? Sure, may I? Yes. Well, I, I think the renewable energy, if certainly in, in Indonesia, uh, in Indonesia, it's, it's mostly um, energy from, from the volcanic emissions that they have. What is difficult in that case is the initial uh, initial discovery of the exact place where you're going to put your power power generator, uh, the exact spot where you, you have to drill. It's like oil drilling. You have and the, the, the cost is upfront in terms of the exact location of the geyser where 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 you where the power is is the strongest. It's a classic example of how a official development assistance program, which would map those those geysers, would be able to identify them and then pass them on to the private sector, which would then come in. The private sector will not come in if you haven't done that initial mapping uh, as such, because the risk is too high. Uh, so we need to find ways in which to de-risk some of these investments through official development assistance and then present them to the private sector because then it will be incentivized and we'll be able to come in uh, with a long, large and long-term investment. This is the gap. Uh, sometimes the, a country like Indonesia, I'm sure, can do it itself, uh, frankly. Uh, it's, a, it's a rich country. <clears throat> Well, that's, a, that's a great uh, answer, and, uh, and I'm thrilled that you were able to address it so directly. You know, you mentioned this idea of de-risking, which is so fundamental in terms of pre-competitive spaces for, for companies, um, and, it's, and it's been very effective as a strategy. We've seen that with BARDA, which is the Biomedical Research Development Agency in, in the United States that's, that's really helped get some novel vaccine constructs up and running. Um, but I want to talk about another initiative, which is the COVAX facility that uh, that the Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance, CEPI, and the World Health Organization have work, are working on together, in which we have a tremendous number of, of, of governments and businesses aligned in this idea of pre-purchase agreements um, and, and a commitment to making sure that everyone in the world has equitable access to vaccine when it comes out. Sanda, I, I would love to get your thoughts on how the, the UN Global Compact is working on those kinds of templates for, for things beyond the COVID uh, challenge. Yeah. So, you know, beyond COVID, and, you know, I'll acknowledge that, you know, our, our partners aren't necessarily engaged in, in the vaccine initiative that you're talking about. But I just want to highlight um, a facility that we recently launched in partnership with the UN Development Program, which is our COVID-19 recovery facility. 
And basically, it's in, it's in recognition of the fact that beyond the large macroeconomic stimulus uh, funding that we see on the ground, a lot of businesses simply just need to rebuild ground up. So, so working with UNDP and uh, the ICC, the International Chamber of Commerce, we've launched this facility starting off in four countries around the world, but with a vast view to expand, where we'll be able to provide not only just technical support, but also, um, you know, financing as and where available, um, you know, developing what ambassadors just called very importantly, what are those bankable projects that you can that you can deal with that have been de-risked, that are appropriate for private sector to take on at the right time. So we're very proud to partner with, with UNDP and the ICC on this. We believe it'll help bridge that macro, the gap between the macro that is so important to get economies going, but also help at the micro level to stimulate um, ground up. So that's just one example of where we've come up really strongly looking at the right types of partnerships for for a COVID recovery. So um, Hank, I'm in the um, I'm in the storytelling business. You know, I'm the editor in chief of Fortune, and and part of what we know works is being able to to tell stories about what does work and sometimes what doesn't work um, in in these efforts. Um, do we do enough storytelling about what has worked? on this front um, and, and encouraging not only people and companies to participate um, in these efforts that the ambassador and Sandra and others have, have worked out, have, have laid out, but, but also giving them a sort of a, 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 a playbook for continuing their investment in a way that they'll see a return. Well, good news, um, uh, good stories don't make news, unfortunately. It's mm-hmm. the bad news that, uh, because on television every day. But there is an example here that relates to Gavi, actually. There is a failure in classical microeconomic theory because the theory says you price where marginal cost equals marginal return. The failure is that then people without the resources can't afford access. And with vaccines, that's tragic. Uh, There is a different theory, which I've long espoused, which is you price on the demand curve. That those who have the resources to pay more, pay more. Those who don't have the resources, pay less. Now, that works in healthcare because your marginal cost, once you've done the research, is very low. It costs pennies to produce the product. So if you have a worldwide price where marginal cost equals marginal return, half the world can't afford it. Pricing on the demand curve, which is kind of what Gavi's doing, is uh, allowing companies to earn the return on their investment, to earn a return on their capital and for their shareholders by having higher prices where people can pay more and lower prices where people can pay less. That works for everybody. Now there's one exception. There's a problem because the problem of that strategy is the people who are paying more start saying, wait a minute, we're paying more than they are and they don't want to pay those high prices. So the good news story has to be understood by everybody that paying a higher price for drugs and vaccines in wealthy countries allows the distribution of those essential products to people in poorer countries. But if you're criticized for your high prices in the developed world, you're going to say, whoa, 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 you back away from this. Uh, We can't afford to provide free medicine to those who can't afford access so that the, the good story has to be understood by those who should be willing to pay higher prices to allow access for people without the resources. Uh, well, I hope they start uh, really emphasizing that in business schools and, uh, and economics programs, because I think that's a really key point. Ambassador, you know, one of the, the sort of most startling metrics is that if you're looking for the, the, the best gauge of, of under five mortality in the world, it's the educational status of the mother. Um, you know, we know that, that uh, women um, who are able to start businesses, who are able to have financial independence, who are able to go to school, we know when young girls go to school, um, societies uh, rapidly progress. Um, and so much of, of our challenge is sort of addressing that slightly larger half of the population, um, women and girls, and making sure that they are supported through these investments. How, how do we do that, and how does business in particular get involved? Uh, I think uh, the 
best strategy, obviously, is a strategy where you incorporate the objective of women's participation in the development process. And that, in order to do that, you have to provide the education, you have to provide the access, you have to provide support, and therefore it becomes a, a automatic process of participation, incorporation of women and girls into the, the whole, the economic activity of of the country. Uh, the, the problem is one of, in many countries, not all, but in, in some countries, the problem is one of access in terms of social structures. Uh, uh, and these is, this is true for conventional societies where acts, the women's access to participate in the larger economy is impeded by social mores uh, which have come down from centuries. Uh, that's, that's where the difficulties come into play and where governments of the countries concerned have to become bold uh, and try and push the envelope in fine ways in which to get the, the, the women and the girls involved uh, in, in, the, in the economy. Uh, as such. I, I see that, you know, I come from a, from a country which is a, uh, also a conventional, traditional society, and, and we have this problem. Uh, wherever we are able uh, to have women participate, and, and the graph has gone up in Pakistan tremendously with urbanization, etc., uh, wherever they're able to participate, the, the contribution is phenomenal. Uh, in terms of the change, not only in the attitude of the women, but the attitude of whole society, the attitude of families towards women's participation and the value that they bring, not only to themselves, but to their children uh, and, and, and to the whole, whole society. So the impact is absolutely clear. The, qu the question is, how do we work on traditional societies and we have to be sensitive to the traditional societies, to the, to the value systems, and find ways to work within those value systems to bring in, to bring in the women into, into, the, into the larger economy. Um, and that's a, that's a policy issue for many, many developing countries. Yes, absolutely. Well, we have two minutes left, and, and I would love to end this with your thoughts, uh, Sanda, on you know, as the executive director of the UN Global Compact, and this is what this session is focused on, how do we address the ambassador's, uh, you know, very smart thoughts um, and, and advice about, um, you know, not only being sensitive culturally, uh, but also bringing business in and, and making sure the incentives are aligned um, with, with bringing women and young girls into, into these business endeavors? Great. And, you know, you, your point when you started was an apt reflection. A, a year ago, I was in a forum and, you know, it, it was evident. I mean, what is the greatest health intervention you can do for marginalized people? Actually, education, not to trivialize the, the immense health issues that are there, but with education comes information. It comes the ability to choose and the ability to make informed decisions. Mm -hmm. I think that's very important. And I, I totally agree with all of the, the sentiments that ambassadors mentioned. I think I would just add on there the role that business can play. And we see it now, especially as a lot of what's going on in COVID has become very digital. You know, the, the power of technology is one that can certainly um, build bridges. But I think in instances and reflecting on the countries that ambassadors talked about, you know, the lack of access to technology has also widened some of those divides. So, you know, a practical call on business here is to look at how we can further issues such as digital connectivity how we can make sure that we have relevant and local content that will help uplift populations that are marginalized, that can help uplift the SME sector, that perhaps can then very quickly get back into business and, and spread their commerce and their winnings. So I think that business has a key role to play in, in really facilitating how some of these gaps are now uh, um, reduced in terms of size and equalizing what the opportunities are, not just to access for information, access to business, access to customers, and helping bridge those divides. I think technology and business has a key role to play here. 
Well, perfect words to end our conversation on. I want to thank Ms. Sanda Ojiambo, um, Ambassador His Excellency Munir Akram, and Dr. Hank McKinnell. Thank you for a great conversation, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.